This show is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. What's the first thing you'd do if you had more time in the day? Take a nap, read a book, talk with a friend? When you know what's important to you, it's easier to fit it into your schedule, and therapy can help you figure that out. BetterHelp offers affordable online therapy that comes to you. Start the process in minutes and make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Learn more at BetterHelp.com super. That's BetterHelp.com super. Hey, brother! Welcome back to another mind-bending journey through the magical world of Harry Potter. Today, we're diving deep into the realm of fan theories, but with a twist. We're pitting human imagination against artificial intelligence. That's right, we fed the most perplexing Harry Potter conundrums into a digital brain, and now it's time to separate fact from fiction, so grab your wands and join us as we debunk AI-generated Harry Potter fan theories. Asio Truth. Guys, before we start destroying AI today, I do want to make a quick announcement that we are going on tour with our Harry Potter podcast through the Griffin door. We're calling it through the Griffin tour. <laughs> See what we did there? But it is happening this June. We're going to Boston, New York, Philadelphia, and Washington, D.C. And tickets are on sale now, and they are going pretty quick. So if you want to come meet us in per person and see us record the show live, uh, link is in the description down below. Okay, so if you couldn't tell, that intro was actually written by ChatGPT, and I have to say, I didn't care for it, nor do I care for AI-generated fan theories, except for how hilariously bad they are. Recently, over in our Discord server, user Tom Faros stumbled across some hilarious ones and suggested that we debunk AI theories, and I loved that idea so much that today we are doing exactly that. So what we did was go over to ChatGPT and asked it to give us its best Harry Potter theories just to see what it would spit out, and well... You'll see. All right, let's kick things off with theory number one. Crookshanks is Regulus Black. This theory suggests that Crookshanks, Hermione's pet cat, is actually Regulus Black, Sirius Black's brother, who has been transformed into an Animagus. Okay, okay, I think I see where you're coming from there, ChatGPT, because like in Prisoner of Azkaban, Crookshanks basically acts as Sirius's man on the inside, you know, stealing passwords for him, giving him information, even just straight up trying to kill Peter. And then later on in the story, we actually do learn that Sirius's brother, Regulus, was a big time supporter of Voldemort and even became a Death Eater before eventually turning on him, learning his secret about the Horcruxes and even managed to steal the locket from the cave. Meanwhile, when Hermione purchases Crookshanks, we learn from the shopkeeper that he's been there a long time and that nobody wanted him. So could it be that Regulus, just like his brother, was secretly an Animagus? That just like Peter used his transformed self as a way to fake his own death? Could that explain why Crookshanks is such a large cat, has such a heightened sense of intelligence and its willingness to partner with Sirius and enact revenge on another Death Eater? I mean, I'm not gonna lie, it certainly sounds fun, but no. The obvious flaw in this theory is that we just know the very specific details of Regulus's death. And he ordered Creature to leave without him, and he told Creature to go home and never tell my mistress what he had done, but to destroy the first locket. And he drank all the potion, and Creature swapped the lockets and watched as Master Regulus was dragged beneath the water and... Good creature. Thank you, thank you. I worked on it for about five seconds. I mean, even if Regulus was secretly an Animagus and could turn into a cat, like, Creature sees him go under the water as a man, and like, cats are famously bad in water. And on top of that, there would just be no reason at all for Sirius not to reveal this information to Harry or for Regulus not to reveal himself as a human. Like it would mean even after Peter reveals himself, Regulus continues to hide his Crookshanks in plain sight. But on top of, on top of that, we also just know the biology of Crookshanks, which is half cat, half measle, and definitely not 100% human, which also explains his intelligence. So no, Crookshanks is not Regulus. But I do think Crookshanks used to belong to the Potters. We know the Potters had a cat because Lily mentions it in her letter to Sirius, and we know they knew someone who breeds Neasles, that's Mrs. Fig, who was in the Order of the Phoenix with them, and then their deaths would account for the length of time that Crookshanks has been in the shop. Plus, it means Crookshanks would have been able to recognize Sirius because he just would have been around the house sometimes. And for sure, Crookshanks would then be anti-Voldemort, and specifically Peter, whose actions killed his owners. But you know, full video right here. 
Next! The Horcrux inside Harry's scar. Okay, not off to a great start, but here's the rest of what it said. This theory challenges the conventional understanding of Harry Potter's connection to Voldemort's soul. It proposes that, in addition to the fragment of Voldemort's soul in his scar, there's a hidden Horcrux inside Harry himself. This Horcrux could have been created unintentionally during the failed curse as a result of Lily's sacrificial protection. This theory could explain some of Harry's unexpected and connections with Voldemort, such as his ability to speak parcel tongue and his ability to sense Voldemort's emotions. Oh, it's so dumb, it's brilliant. No! It's just dumb. It is just dumb. Like, what are you talking about? Changes the conventional understanding of Harry and Voldemort's connection? If I'm reading this right, ChatGPT, you're saying that Harry has a piece of Voldemort's soul in his scar and then secretly another piece inside of him making him a horcrux. Okay, so like just first of all, there is not a piece of soul in Harry's scar at all. That's just like not a thing. And two, it's already canon that he's a horcrux. It has a piece of soul in him and the theory that it was unintentionally created when Voldemort attacked Lily is is not a theory, it's just it's just exactly what happened. And then also, Harry's ability to speak to snakes and sense Voldemort's emotions are not unexplained. Those are both explained because he's the Horcrux. Like, geez, read the books next time, ChatGPT. Next! Okay, now we need to pause right there to give you a huge thank you to today's sponsor, MeUndies. Now, of course, I don't want to speak for anyone other than myself here, but for me, personally, I think happiness starts at the foundation, which you may interpret to mean in that warm, deep center of your soul. But of course, what I actually mean is under bridges. I mean, think of it like this. It's the first thing you put on. The first decision is setting the tone for your outfit, which sets the tone for your mood, which sets the tone for your whole day. It all starts with underwear. Didn't have anything to land on. Or at least it does for me, personally, whenever I put on my own MeUndies every morning. Because MeUndies' signature fabric is as soft as a warm hug from your favorite sweater. It's breathable, stretchy, and oh so comfy, making it ideal for all day wear. Plus, they use sustainably sourced materials and work with partners that care for their workers so you can feel good whilst you're feeling good. Trust me, you're gonna find it hard not to smile. <laughs> Good things come in big packages at MeUndies, so get 20% off your first order, plus free shipping at MeUndies.com super. That's MeUndies.com super for 20% off, plus free shipping. MeUndies, comfort from the outside in. The Weasley twins are really one person using Polyjuice Potion. According to this theory, Fred and George are actually one person using Polyjuice Potion to appear as two different people simultaneously, explaining their remarkable similarity and synchronicity. He's not Fred, I am. Honestly, woman, you call yourself our mother. Uh, Yeah, okay, wow, that one almost broke my brain. I mean, first of all, if they're one person, like, Polyjuice can't make them appear as two people at the same time. That's not what it does. I think, I think what you mean, ChatGPT, is that one of them is the real twin and the other is just another guy who is in disguise as the first one all the time? Welcome to the world of the living. And when I say all the time, what I mean is it would have had to have been happening since the moment the real twin was born. Like, so Molly and Arthur would have had to have taken in a second baby and just decided that instead of being itself, it would be a twin. And then that, that kid would just grow up doing that every day and I guess be in on it the whole time too, because otherwise Percy and Charlie and Bill would be aware of it. Yeah, but that's why it's so brilliant. Cause it's so pathetically dim witted. There's just no motivation here to do that. Like my, my one thought to try and like force this to be true was that like maybe it was Molly's way of dealing with the death of her brothers, Fabian and Gideon from who the F and G come from. But like they die post the twins birth. So no. Also, and not that I feel like I have to do too much work to disprove this one, but like, you know, Fred dies at the end and 
in death remains in Fred form. So presumably he'd transform back if he was the one doing the polyjuice, meaning that George would have to be the clone and he'd no longer have access to the real one's body post-mortem and like George never changes back to his true form then. So uh, no, the whole thing's terrible and dumb and I hate it. Next, Voldemort's true mother. Oh really now? Okay. Enlighten me. This theory suggests that Tom Riddle's true mother is actually Bathilda Bagshot, the celebrated author of A History of Magic and a close friend of Albus Dumbledore. Here's how it unfolds. Voldemort's obsession with his own lineage and magical history is well documented. If his true mother were Bathilda Bagshot, it would add another layer to his fascination with the past and his desire to carve out his own legacy. Yeah, I guess it would mean that, but what? I mean, gosh, I don't even know where to begin. Like, I mean, you know, um, Nagini's venom is part of the potion that helps rebirth Voldemort, making her something of a mother to him. Voldemort is super evil, so the idea of making Nagini then go inhabit the, the dead skin of his actual mother would pretty much be the most demented thing I've ever heard, so I, li I like where your head's at. Does AI have a head in your brain? But also just no, there's no grounds for this reality at all. I mean, if, if Bathilda is his mother, then he's not the heir of Slytherin and, and can't control the Basilisk or open the Chamber of Secrets. And also, why on earth would his true name be Tom Riddle then? Like, is Bethilda Bagshot framing a random muggle man in addition to being the spawn point for a supervillain? I guess Bethilda was the aunt of Grindelwald, so the idea that the Bagshot line just produces dark wizards would be fun, but yeah, there is, there is literally nothing here. But I'm not done, because we also just have straight up memories of Voldemort's real mother, a known descendant of Slytherin pining after Tom Riddle Sr. and accounts of her leaving him at the orphanage. So like, y that said, I have always wondered how Merope made the love potion to, you know, seduce Tom Riddle. Cause she didn't exactly seem super gifted with magic and it's a pretty complicated potion to make, like NEWT level, so like, Gosh, I don't know, maybe if there had been a Slytherin potion master who maybe would have favored someone with a famous lineage, like Slytherin, that could have been willing to help and then been ashamed of his actions. Like, I don't just, does that sound like anybody? Full video. Dumbledore's secret plan. I feel like I'm doing a very good digital voice. Secret plan, okay, off to a good start. We've made videos along this line before, but let, let's see what they say. This theory proposes the idea that Harry himself inadvertently became a Horcrux for Voldemort when the Dark Lord attempted to kill him as a baby. However, this was not a mere accident, but rather a calculated move by Albus Dumbledore to ensure Voldemort's ultimate defeat. Here's how it unfolds. Dumbledore, known for his extensive knowledge of magic and his ability to foresee events, likely deduced the possibility of Voldemort creating multiple Horcruxes to safeguard his immortality. Realizing that Voldemort would target Harry, Dumbledore seized the opportunity to turn the tables on the Dark Lord. Dumbledore, recognizing this possibility, chose to keep it secret, knowing that Harry's survival was crucial for defeating Voldemort in the future. Oh goodness, chat GPT. So basically you're saying that Dumbledore was so ahead of the curve that he conspired for a situation where Voldemort purposely breaks through the Fidelius charm, offers Lily a choice to live, knowing that she'd choose death, and then unknowingly cast sacrificial protection on Harry, thus causing Avada Kedavra to backfire onto Voldemort, ripping his soul in the process so that a part of it accidentally would latch onto Harry so that in the future Harry could feel Voldemort's emotions? So Harry would need to die. So so Harry could talk to snakes. So I like like just imagine that was actually the scenario, and then like this scene unfolds. Dumbledore smiled at Harry, and Harry stared at him. And you you knew this? You knew all along? I guessed, but my guesses have usually been good, said Dumbledore happily. At which point Harry's just like bullshit. And look, I get it, ChatGPT. I'm a big believer in Dumbledore's big plan and the idea that he's pulling the strings on Harry's life to prepare him to defeat Voldemort. I mean, we made an entire seven video series about it, but this, this is a step too far. Like, I mean, for one, the idea that Dumbledore would try to create a situation for Lily to die is just 
just bonkers. As is the idea that he'd be able to guess she'd even be offered the chance to live. But what really disproves this is that it would require Dumbledore to know that Voldemort was using Horcruxes ahead of time, which he does not discover until Chamber of Secrets. And even if he knew about the Horcruxes ahead of time, intentionally turning Harry into one is not helpful. Like, if he knew ahead of time, just start trying to hunt down the other ones. Don't force Harry into a situation where he has to die. Next, Nicholas Flamel created the Mirror of Erised. You know what? We don't know a lot about either of these things, so on the surface level, I don't hate it. I'm prepared to be sold, ChatGPT. Dazzle me. The theory proposes that Nicholas Flamel, the famed alchemist known for creating the Philosopher's Stone, is also the creator of the Mirror of Erised. Here's how it unfolds. Nicholas Flamel is renowned for his alchemical knowledge and achievements. The Philosopher's Stone, which grants immortality and turns any metal into gold, demonstrates his mastery of alchemy. It's plausible that Flamel would have the ability to create magical artifacts such as the Mirror of Erised. Flamel's pursuit of the Philosopher's Stone was driven by his desire for knowledge and the elixir of life. The Mirror of Erised, which reveals the deepest desires of one's hearts, could have been another creation born out of Flamel's quest for understanding human desires and motivations. Wow, okay, well consider me not dazzled. Like this just does not use nearly enough known information about Flamel or the mirror to make a sound argument. All you are saying, ChatGPT, is that because it was difficult to make the Philosopher's Stone, it stands to the reason that he could make another complicated magical artifact as well. Like, that's basically it. Which, hey, you know, to be fair, Edison does have over a thousand patents, but like, this theory is lacking some serious lore, in my opinion. Now, honestly, I don't hate the idea that, like, Flamel maybe learned how to make the stone from the mirror. Like, if that was his deepest desire, it just showed him how to do it. I mean, like, when Harry looks in the mirror, at least in the book, he's able to see, like, entire generations of his family. He can he have no idea what they look like, but they are accurately portrayed. So, like, maybe the mirror could show you things that, like, no one else has even done. I don't know the limits of the mirror. But, like, even that's a stretch, though, because the history of Flamel and the mirror are just, like, both shrouded in mystery. You don't look a day over 375. In fact, if you go into the Pottermore archives, it is canon that nobody knows who created it or how it came to be at Hogwarts school. If that's true, it seems to me that if you're comfortable with people knowing you made the Philosopher's Stone, you'd also be comfortable with people knowing about the mirror, especially since according to that exact same article, the Mirror of Erised is one of those magical artifacts that seems to have been created in a spirit of fun. As if it wasn't created and then immediately deemed like, oh, this is a dangerous object, don't tell people. But on that note, we do know of a different magical inventor who I would argue is a way better fit for the mirror, and that is Cadmus Peveril, AKA the second brother and inventor or recipient of the Resurrection Stone. In King's Cross, Dumbledore argues that the Peveril brothers did not actually meet death on a lonely road, but instead were just magically powerful and succeeded in creating each of the Hallows. Interestingly, the Resurrection Stone and the Mirror of Erised are really not all that different. Like, they both possess the ability to show you the thing you desire the most, but neither can truly provide that desire. And we know for Cadmus, this leads to his own death so that he can join his late love. But then and Dumbledore also cautions Harry, This mirror will give us neither knowledge or truth. Men have wasted away before it, entranced by what they have seen, or been driven mad, not knowing if what it shows is real or even possible. So use the stone, it can show you the person you love, but it will kind of drive you mad and want to die. Dumbledore says if you stare at the mirror long enough, it could just drive you mad. So you can see how they're kind of similar. But then you might be wondering if Cadmus made a second thing, did Ignotus and Antioch make other things too? And the answer in my mind is, yes they did. Full video here. <laughs> There you go, guys. That is a ChatGPT's best effort at coming up with some Harry Potter fan theories. I have to say, don't think they're uh, really up to the task uh, just yet, but who knows? I mean, it's only 2024, so maybe by next year they'll just be outclassing us and it'll be like, well, 
We had a good run, but either way, I had a blast making this video. So huge shout out to Tom Froze over in our Discord server for suggesting it to us. If you want to join our Discord server, you can do so over at uh, patreon.com slash supercarlinbrothers. It is always a good time in the Discord. It always gets um, a little bit crazy in there, but you know, you just got to jump in and don't be afraid. The uh, community of people there is awesome. So again, uh, patreon.com slash supercarlinbrothers, and maybe we'll do one of your ideas. ChatGPT might have mentioned Dumbledore's secret plan today, but we all know that it's really called Dumbledore's Big Plan, which if you don't know what that is, I highly recommend you check out this video right here. It goes book by book across the entire series to show how Dumbledore is actually pulling the strings on Harry's life behind the scenes uh, the entire time. It is one of my favorite series that we've ever done, so I hope you enjoyed. But otherwise, Ben, until next time, I will see you in the